welcome back to the International Institute's Conference on Gender and Health. Uh, my name is Alana Rodriguez, and I'm the program manager at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, one of the many units that's sponsoring this conference today. So it's my pleasure to open the second panel of our conference. This panel is titled Maternal, Infant, and Child Health in Comparative Perspective. And I'm thrilled to introduce the moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, today we have Grace Argo, who's a PhD candidate in history and women's and gender studies here at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the historical treatment of child sex abuse in the United States. Her work is supported by the Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies and by a Rackham Predoctoral Fellowship here at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us today, Grace, and enjoy the panel. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Alana, and thank you everyone for joining our second panel of the day, which will be running until 2 p.m. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers representing diverse academic disciplines here to share their research with us on the theme of maternal, infant, and child health in comparative perspective. Dr. Seema Jayachandran joins us from the Economic Department at Northwestern University to discuss the important role of eldest sons in Indian families and how eldest son preference shapes couples' fertility decisions and their investments in their children in India with important implications for girls' health. Dr. Cheryl Moyer joins us from the University of Michigan School of Medicine to present her work on maternal and newborn health in Sub-Saharan Africa, focusing on the role that gender plays at the individual, household, community, and health system levels. Anthropologist and demographer, Dr. Monica Dasgupta joins us from the University of Maryland to explain some of the reasons that South Korea has seen a rapid and radical shift um, in recent years, from a preference for sons to a growing preference for daughters. And Daniel Idrisu joins us from the MA program in International and Regional Studies at the University of Michigan to share his research on the role of female-headed households in the prevention, care-seeking, and treatment of malaria in Ghana. This panel promises us new and exciting ways to think about gender and health at local, national, and global scales, and invites us to study closely the impact of cultural and historical change on maternal, infant, and child health. I'm very much looking forward to our panelists' presentations and to the rich discussion sure to follow. Each of our panelists will speak for approximately 15 minutes, and I encourage everyone to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions to the panelists, which we will take up in the Q&A period after all of the panelists have finished speaking. Closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screens by clicking on the live transcript button. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Seema Jayachandran. Dr. Jayachandran is a professor of economics at Northwestern University, whose research focuses on economic issues in developing countries, including gender equality, labor markets, health, and environmental con uh, cons conservation. She serves on the board of directors at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, also known as JPAL, and is the chair of JPAL's gender sector. She is also co-director of the National Bureau of Economic Research's Program in Development Economics and co-editor of the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics. In addition, Dr. Jaya Chandran writes regularly for the New York Times and serves on CARE's Board of Directors. Prior to joining Northwestern, she taught at Stanford University. She earned a PhD in economics from Harvard University, a master's degree in physics and philosophy as a Marshall Scholar at the University of Oxford, and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from MIT. Please welcome Dr. Jaya Chandra. Thank you so much, Grace, for the introduction and uh, for including me in this panel. So I'm going to uh, share my slides and get started. Okay, so uh, Monica is the only one I can see. You can give me a thumbs up or uh, shake your head if you can't see my slides, but I'm gonna assume this is working and um, start talking to you about sun preference and some implications for girls' health in India. So I guess my, you know, my, when I started working uh, on gender equality in India, uh, it's, you know, a lot of the folk, my focus is on in India is because in some cases, 
gender equality is getting worse with economic development. You know, that, that pattern is actually mostly not true, or mostly if there's a quite uh, optimistic story where with economic development, many aspects of gender equality seem to get better. So here's one, this is the ratio of men to women who go to college. And on the, that's on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis, is the GDP per capita of a country. And you could see that that gap, uh, the higher the level, that's something favoring men. And, that, and it tends to be higher in poor countries and lower in richer countries. So obviously, you know, this isn't causal, but you see the same thing over time as countries develop. A lot of these gaps um, in healthcare, in education tend to, to narrow. And I think there are some good reasons as women become um, more productive in the labor market with a more advanced economy that's going to help them get educated, have power in society to help their health, um, et cetera. But, you know, there are exceptions to that rule where the process of economic development, you know, isn't helping uh, bring about gender equality. And in fact, sometimes it can make it worse. And I think one case where that seems to be true is with the male skewed sex ratio. So this is the same kind of figure where we have something that's undesirable and a favoritism towards boys, which is the sex ratio at birth, which is mostly from, you know, is, is from sex selective abortions. And you could see there's not that same negative correlation with GDP per capita. You know, it's basically flat. If anything, it's a little bit positive, which is probably related to biology, not behavior. Um, so this is a case where it doesn't seem to be a problem concentrated in poor countries, it solves itself in rich countries. And in fact, it's, you know, what really stands out is that there are a few outliers that um, where the problem is concentrated. So this is both kind of not related to economic development. If anything, it seems to be getting worse with economic development. Though Monica is going to talk about how in South Korea that's, that's reversed. Um, and it's particular to, to certain societies. Um, and you know what's kind of at the root of, of that sex selection that's happening in India and China and the Caucasus and you know, previously a lot in South Korea uh, is a desire for sons that people want to, families want to have sons. And so they have an abortion if they have, um, if they have daughters, but they haven't had the number of sons they want. So I think you know, one distinction that I think is important uh, to make is, is, you know, some preference, the terminology, some preference, both encompasses, you know, a desire for sons and giving more resources to sons. And, you know, both types of favoritism for sons are seen in India. I think one big difference is that, you know, giving more resources for sons is often seen across countries and is, is, is part of economic development. So, you know, those gender gaps in college, they get smaller as a country gets richer. But the, the desire to have sons, the importance of having um, a son in the family, you know, is, is much uh, more tied to particular cultural and religious norms that are specific to some societies. You know, so in India and in a lot of places where there is a problem of a skewed sex ratio, it's related to patrilocality, the fact that uh, parents will go and live with their eldest son, their eldest son is, is the one who the lineage passes down to, so both in terms of kind of the status of the family and this is your lineage and just financial support, those eldest sons play an important role. And then, you know, in India and in Hinduism, a, an eldest son plays an important role in funeral rites. And so for all of these reasons, a family really wants to have um, that eldest son. And so a lot of my research is thinking about what are the consequences of that strong desire for an eldest son and exploring ways that it can have you know, almost unintended consequences on the well-being of, of other kids in the family and in particular girls. Um, so you know, there are two ways that you can achieve uh, having a son if you're not getting one naturally. You know, one is you're having kids, you're hoping for a son, you don't have a son, and so you can keep having children. So after a daughter's birth, you'll just have more children. And then the second one is you can intervene by having an ultrasound and finding the, the sex of a fetus and having a sex selective abortion. So when I show you the, the, the data on the skewed sex ratio, that's coming from sex selective abortion, which is increasingly common. And that's going to you know, lead to more boys in society than girls, more men in society than, than women. What I'm going to talk about 
uh, in the rest of my time is about kind of implications for families when instead of having a sex selective abortion, they're trying again to have a son. And you know, it's going to have implications for uh, in a couple of ways. One is it's going to affect the spacing between births, because if you don't have a son and you feel some societal pressure, your mother-in-law is putting pressure on you to have a son, you're going to speed up when you have another child to, to try to get that son. Um, so after the birth of a the daughter, there'll be less spacing. It also means you know, family size is gonna be larger than originally planned. If you wanted a family size of two and you had a girl and a girl, and then you keep trying for a third child or a fourth child when you to get a boy, that means you're going to have the same economic resources, but spread over um, more children. And for both of those reasons, that can hurt um, other siblings' health. So the one example is about breastfeeding uh, in India and the difference between girls and boys. So this is a survival curve that's showing whether a child is still being breastfed at different ages, where the red is uh, boys and the blue is girls. And the fact that at least, you know, starting at about six months, the red line is above the blue line means that kind of at any age, boys are more likely to be breastfed than girls. Parents, mothers wean daughters sooner than um, they wean their sons. And you know, the, this has implications for child health in, um, especially you know, in, in less developed countries where the, if you're not having breast milk, you might be having less nutritious and more likely to be contaminated cow's milk or water or um, other food. And, you know, and there are lots of cases where parents are investing more in son's health than daughters. And so that could be the, you know, the explanation. They, parents give more vaccines to their sons. They give they have more health visits for their son, so they just care to invest more. But you know, in this project, we we show that that doesn't really that's not really the explanation for that for this pattern. It's really a, an inadvertent effect of wanting to have another son. So the you know the way this happens is kind of through two reasons. One is parents might know that uh, if you're breastfeeding, that makes you less likely to be fertile and be able to uh, conceive again. So if you know that and you were trying to conceive again after the birth of a daughter to, in order to get a son, you're going to wean that daughter sooner. And that means she's going to be breastfed less, you know, in your quest to have another son. It can also be because, you know, parents, you don't even need to know that. It's just that you do have some fecundity, some ability to conceive when you're breastfeeding. But once you become pregnant again, that's a, a, a reason that many women stop breastfeeding their first, their older child. And so getting pregnant because you wanted a son is going to trigger weaning. And so I'm not going to kind of go through all of the evidence for this, but you know, if you want to kind of say, what are the signatures of this in the data, you should see that girls are really disadvantaged when you know, the family would have stopped having kids at that point if they had had a son, but because they've had a daughter, that's changing their fertility and making them continue again. So, you know, boys and girls are kind of treated the same at first births and second births, because in any case, you know, families might continue to have kids. And then, you know, eventually families might give up and say, okay, we don't have any sons, we're going to stop. But in this middle range of, you know, birth order of three or four, that's where you see the gap between girls and boys being higher. So this orange uh, triangles are how much higher boys are, how much longer boys are breastfed relative to girls at different birth order. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can use data on whether families have achieved their ideal family size. And if they've had to go beyond their ideal family size and yet they, and they still don't have a daughter, that's where you see girls get breastfed for less time. The second example is related to children's height in India. So there's a, a, a longstanding puzzle of why there's a higher rate of stunting or low height for age in India compared to equally poor countries. So one of the benchmarks is Sub-Saharan Africa, which on average India is richer than Sub-Saharan African uh, countries, but there's a higher rate of child stunting or lower mean height for age. Uh, and what this research with Rohini Pandey shows is that that height disadvantage in India is very much concentrated in higher birth order children. So if you look at first births, there is no height disadvantage in India. It really materializes only for second births and higher order births. And we found that we thought this was an interesting and important fact because a lot of the explanations for why India, Indian children are short, you wouldn't expect there to be differences among siblings. 
like if it's about genetics, a firstborn child and a secondborn child have the same genetics on average. Or if it was about sanitation and access to, to toilets, that's also common across children. It doesn't mean that those aren't part of the explanation, but there's something else going on that within families, parents are giving more resources to children, to firstborn children, to uh, which enables them to be healthier and, and as measured by being taller. So in all societies, firstborns are, are advantage. It's just much more true in India than elsewhere. And so kind of well, how is this related to sun preference? It seems to be that eldest sun preference is part of why there's such a drop off in investments in child health with birth order. So it's easiest to see among boys, like if you're the eldest son is going to be an earlier birth order than other sons, and if he's the favored son, he's gonna get more inputs. It's more subtle why there's a why having this eldest son preference would lead to a birth order gradient among girls. But what it stems from is that point I was making that parents are having more children than they anticipated, and that means they're having to spread their resources more thinly. So, you know, after a birth of a later born girl, that's when you, you know, after your second daughter or third daughter, that's when you realize, oh no, I haven't had a son, I'm going to have to have more kids. And so you're revising upwards how many family, how many kids you're going to have, your income hasn't changed, and so you need to make adjustments. And so who's going to bear the brunt of that adjustment? It's going to be that daughter who was just born, who's going to get fewer resources at a very critical um, age for her cognitive development and her height, et cetera. And so for those reasons, this like, desire for an eldest son ends up hurting both other boys, but also creating this gradient among girls. Um, so here's uh, kind of a, a picture to kind of show you that eldest son preference seems to be behind what's going on in India. This is the blue dots in the line are African countries where it's GDP per capita on the horizontal axis and the mean height. And you could see in richer countries, uh, there's higher average height. And you could see India is below the predicted value for based on sub-Saharan Africa. And this is for girls. And you see India is below for girls. It's also below for boys who are not the eldest son in the family. And where it's much closer to the regression line, where you know, there might be something else going on, but the puzzle of Indian kids being short is much smaller, is when you look at eldest sons specifically. Another way to see that some preference seems to be part of what's going on here is if we look in the, the matrilineal parts of, of India, Kerala and the Northeast, these green triangles, you can see that girls are only slightly disadvantaged, non-eldest sons are, are only slightly disadvantaged, and you know, again, eldest sons, there may be a little bit more favoritism for them, but basically the gaps across children within a family um, are much smaller. So just to wrap up, you know, Families trying again to have a son ends up having you know, kind of unintended negative consequences on girls' health. It wasn't that parents were saying, you know, breastfeeding is great. I want to do more of it for a son than a daughter. They wanted to have that another a son. And on the way and to achieve that, there, there was some collateral damage to girls' health. It's unlikely that economic progress is going to swiftly erode this desire for an eldest son in, in um, or you know, at least it's we can't lean on that. Um, you know, and that's economic progress is causing more families to shift to the alternative solution of, of sex selective abortion, which is just raises a different problem. And so I think it's an important question is, you know, what policy measures can we use to, you know, erode this strong aversion to having uh, only girls and or in the meantime, what can we do so that the allocation of resources within families is more equitable? Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Jayachandran. Everyone, please um, submit questions for Dr. Jayachandran in the Q&A um, box, and we will move forward with our panel um, by introducing our next speaker, Dr. Cheryl Moyer. Um, Dr. Moyer is an Associate Professor of Learning Health Sciences and Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Michigan Medical School. She is also the Associate Chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Department of Learning Health Sciences. And her research focuses on the social and cultural factors that influence maternal and neonatal health outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa, including an emphasis on facility-based delivery, neonatal mortality, social autopsy, and the assessment of near-miss mortality, or those mothers and babies who suffer a life-threatening complication but ultimately survive. 
Dr. Moyer led a three-year U.S. aid-funded project in northern Ghana that used social autopsies to explore maternal and neonatal deaths, sociocultural audits to explore the determinants of maternal and neonatal near misses, and GIS technology to map the location of deaths and near misses against clinical, demographic, social, and cultural de determinants. She also serves as a co-investigator on a randomized clinical trial of group based prenatal care in 14 hospitals in the Eastern region of Ghana. Please welcome Dr. Moyer. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And what a treat to be on this panel today. I am certainly um, very thrilled to spend the time with you all and um, let me know if you cannot see my screen for whatever reason. Does that look all right? Okay. Well, th again, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am Cheryl Moyer, and I am faculty in the medical school here at the University of Michigan, but I am public health trained through and through. So my background is in both health behavior, health education, and health services research, health management, and policy. So um, I come at this with a slightly different orientation than my my faculty appointment might suggest. The other thing I will say is, you know, I am not a trained gender scholar. So I, I'm a public health researcher. So my observations today aren't grounded in gender theory or feminist theory. They're observations that my team and I have made over years doing this work. The other thing I have to say is I'm so thrilled that the fourth panelist is Daniel Idrisu from Ghana from Northern Ghana actually, because there's nothing worse for me than talking about Ghana as if I have a right to do that. So Daniel, I fully empower you to correct me if there's anything I say that you disagree with or that's wrong, um, because that's I think a, a big important piece of this is I wish my partners were here to talk as well. So let me start and say that I have no conflicts of interest to declare financial or otherwise. And I'm gonna talk about two things today. The first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about grandmothers and the role that grandmothers have had in the research that we've done and in our observations. And then I wanna talk a little bit about blame. Who gets the blame and where is it coming from and how does gender play into this issue of blame? And spoiler, it's the women who get blamed. Not that that's gonna be a big surprise to any of you. So, First, let me start by talking about our partners. This, all of this is, is teamwork. And we've had partnerships with several parts of the Ghana Health Service, including the Navrongo Health Research Center in Northern Ghana, the Dodoa Health Research Center in Southern Ghana. And one of my good partners is at the Centresu Government Hospital in Kumasi, Ghana. We also had partners at Baptist Medical Center in Nalerigu in the Northern region. And these are just a few of my partners. So they should be the ones standing here talking about this, not me, but just to know that this has been a huge team effort. At the University of Michigan, I've had partners at Global Reach in the medical school within my home departments of learning health sciences and OBGYN, as well as at the School of Public Health. And these are just a few of my partners who have been with me along this journey. So let me give a little bit of backstory. My involvement in Ghana started back in 2008. We had a collaborative grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that crossed the School of Public Health and the medical school and several different institutions in Ghana. It was called Charter, which if I remember correctly stands for like the Collaborative Health Alliance for Reshaping training, education, and research, I think. Um, the, the emphasis was human resource capacity development, and my involvement was around research capacity development. So in that process, you can probably see me in the second row of that photo, I had the opportunity to work with researchers from all over Ghana and connected with a couple who were working in Northern Ghana. And we had this beautiful conversation about the existing health and demographic surveillance systems and what data they were collecting and what additional data they would like to collect. And that led to the stillbirth and neonatal death study called SANS, which was initially funded by the African Study Center here at the University of Michigan and the African Social Research Initiative. It was funded on a wing and a prayer 
And it hit at a really good time because several of us in that process were getting our PhDs and it became a really wonderful anchor point to dig in and learn a lot through mixed methods, qual mostly qualitative work. SANS queued our team up to be able to submit for a USAID call. And that, was, that led to PREMAND, which was preventing maternal and neonatal deaths in Northern Ghana. And then while we were in the thick of PREMAND, one of our partners at Baptist Medical Center um, was able to write for a small global reach grant here at the University of Michigan to do a supplemental community study looking at why community members thought moms and babies were having not so great outcomes. So it was a bit of an, an exploratory attribution study. So this is the context that I'm drawing on here. So I'm not going to talk about one individual study necessarily, but thinking about all of this together has taught us a lot, I think, and raised a lot of questions. So let me start by talking about grandmothers. This is a photo on the right of a focus group in Northern Ghana that we conducted as part of SANS. And the quote on the left is from a physician in the community who said, here in this environment, the grandmothers, they have a lot of clout. When I say grandmothers, I'm talking about the mothers-in-law, the grandmother of the baby. They have a lot of power. Usually the married woman lives in the husband's compound. So it's not her own mother who matters. It's her husband's mother who calls the shots. And we looked at, so, okay, so what exactly is the role of grandmothers? They provide sources of information, guidance, and support. And this is a quote from one of our focus groups. If you have a mother-in-law, she has to advise the woman about the do's and don'ts of pregnancy. And often this is in an environment where sometimes the pregnant women are relatively young. So in addition to the hierarchy within the family, you have a, a hierarchy in age. Grandmothers also preserve cultural traditions around pregnancy and newborn care, including things like burying the placenta or putting traditional treatments on the umbilical cord. And grandmothers are often the sources of local knowledge and traditional medicine. So when something goes wrong, people look to the grandmothers to figure out often the first course of action. There's also a huge role they play in care seeking. Our interviewer asked, how would you know if your baby's sick? And the respondent says, well, I wouldn't know unless I asked my mother-in-law. And the interviewer says, how about if it's a convulsion? Thinking that that would be pretty obvious. And the respondent says, well, we will go to the clinic, but with my mother-in-law's permission. So clearly grandmothers have a pretty prominent role in driving a whole lot of things. And this is an interesting situation that compares to previous research that emphasized the role of men in terms of economic gatekeeping. But grandmothers seem to be able to work around the system and get what they need. I think this quote also stood out to me because um, clearly there are people learning that grandmothers are a worthy intervention target. Now the Ghana Red Cross has taught us, the grandmothers, that we should always send the babies to the hospital if they're sick. You don't have to sit and wait for the husband to come. If the baby's sick and the father's not around, you must send him to the hospital. So we, the grandmothers, take such decisions when it comes to the baby's health. So let me talk a little bit now about blame. And this does anchor on um, the Dr. Vic project that I mentioned earlier, but it's not certainly unique to that, but this is where these data come from. So um, Dr. Vic uh, conducted focus groups and individual interviews with 126 respondents across four of these communities that you see here in East Mamprusi, which is in Northern Ghana, if you look at the box on the bottom left. And her question was, why do you think moms and babies are not always having such great outcomes? And what we found was really two different ways of approaching the discussion. There was a situational attribution that basically said, well, bad pregnancy outcomes are rooted in the circumstances here. And then we saw a behavioral attribution that said bad pregnancy outcomes are really women's fault. And that was kind of the overall finding. And then that held true across many different layers that I'm gonna show you now. 
So with regard to physical labor, the situational attribution says, well, women have to work to feed their families, including working in the fields. This is an area where there's subsistence farming. And if you don't work in your fields or you don't work in your garden, you don't eat. Versus the behavioral attribution that says, well, women are hard headed and they keep working and they work too hard while they're pregnant. And that's why bad things happen to them. With regard to nutrition, the situational attribution says, well, there's food insecurity and there's poverty, which means a lack of sufficient nutrition. And if a woman asks for more food or asks for money for food, that can spark violence within the household. So, you know, it's, you just don't do that. Versus the behavioral attribution that says, women don't eat properly to support their pregnancies. It's their fault they're not eating right. With regard to hygiene, the situational attribution is, well, water must be fetched from a borehole that's pretty far away. And, you know, women need to carry it in a, on a pot, in a pot on their head, back to their house, and they use it for, you know, preparing meals, et cetera. And whatever's left over is what she can use to bathe with. The behavioral attribution is just women don't keep themselves clean enough while pregnant. And that's why they get infections and it's their fault really. With regard to care seeking, situational attribution says women don't have money or transportation to seek care. Whereas the behavioral attribution is that women are lazy and they don't go for antenatal care and they don't go for healthcare because they're lazy. And then what's the role of the family or the community? The situational attribution would say that women often need permission from their husband or from their community to seek care. We have focus group data where literally they bring a sick baby to the middle of the village and everyone gathers around and makes a decision about whether this baby is worth taking to the hospital versus the behavioral attribution that, you know, pregnancy is not a man's concern. It's up to her. So, you know, it's, it's her problem if something goes wrong. And then of course there are other factors. This idea that a situational attribution would be that bad outcomes are the will of God versus it's women's fault because they're adulterers or sinners. And so if they have a bad outcome, they've done something wrong to deserve that. So how does gender figure into all of these issues? You know, in the case of grandmothers, their seniority affords them power that can supersede the gender norms. They can kind of work around some of what's expected of women because the hierarchy in the family is such that they are seen as worth listening to. In the case of blame, it's women who are blamed for the bad outcomes. We didn't hear anything about men being blamed for domestic violence, for the failure to provide sufficient food, for denying care seeking or not helping their wives in the field. There's also a few issues related to gender that I wanted to raise, but aren't, I'm not gonna talk about in great detail today. The first is the gender of the baby, which you know, is so interesting juxtaposing the Ghanaian context against what Seema just presented. So in Ghana, there really isn't a noticeable sun preference. So we don't really see many differences based upon the gender of the child. But there is a difference with regard to gender of those in power that I think does play in here. We see male chiefs in the villages, they're typically male chiefs. And then in the clinic, in the Western healthcare setting, it's typically female midwives and nurses. And I can't help but wonder, how does it go over when the female midwives and nurses are talking about what's okay and not okay, and the male chiefs in the villages are supposed to be listening and, and absorbing that information? And then the other thing nobody seems to talk about is the gender of the research team. So we had men and women on both sides, but by and large, our Ghana team was disproportionately male. By and large, our Michigan team was disproportionately female. And I think that's a really interesting area to consider how gender plays into the dynamics on the research team and how it plays into how we go about what we do. But again, that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> so in sum, I think it's safe to say that gender plays a significant role in maternal and newborn health, health research and health outcomes in Northern Ghana. And while our team has not explicitly engaged in gender theory or feminist frameworks in our research, 
The impact of gender is an important construct worthy of further study in this region. And let me just finish by saying thank you. And my email is at the bottom. Feel free to reach out to me at any point. I would love any sort of comments or questions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Moyer. Um, again, everyone, please submit questions in the Q&A function in the uh, chat bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will move on to our next panelist, Dr. Monica Dasgupta. Dr. Monica Dasgupta is a research professor at the University of Maryland, College Park. Before that, she worked in the World Bank's Development Research Group in Washington, DC, Harvard University Center for Population and Development Studies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the National Council of Applied Economic Research in New Delhi. She trained in anthropology and demography at the London School of Economics and the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Sussex. She has published extensively on issues of population, poverty, and development, including on child health, gender and health, and public health systems for communicable disease control. Please welcome Dr. Monica Dasgupta. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, so, um, let's see. Um, as you know, I'm going to be talking about sun preference and missing girls in Asia. Uh, what drives this, what might help reduce it. And there's a lot of interesting lessons we can learn from the experience in South Korea. So first, what are the drivers of sex selection? Are they primarily economic or primarily cultural or both? And in a given setting, what exacerbates sex selection? And then what reduces it? Specific policies might help reduce it and broader social changes might help reduce it. And then I'll talk about the transition that's taken place in South Korea in a shift from son preference to daughter preference. So the drivers of son preference. Um, women offer lower economic returns potentially um, to their parents than sons pretty much universally. Um, women's earning capacity is limited um, because in pre-industrial settings, it was limited by the fact that land was typically passed on through the male line. So male men inherited the land and that was of course the main productive resource. In industrialized societies, women's earnings are reduced by the fact um, as is familiar to all of us, childbearing, domestic work burdens, and choices that are steered by the education system, parents, etc., who feel that certain kinds of occupation are better for women than, um, the, than others. Um, and typically these are lower paid than the occupations that men are steered into. So if women are typically are less likely to be able to offer financial protection to their parents, why then is sex selection commonly found? Um, this is because essentially um, patrilineal families come in two broad types. Most of them across Europe, uh, across Japan, most of these offer some scope for helping parents. Especially if there are no brothers, the woman can inherit land and she can remain single uh, in her parents' home. That's acceptable. And typically in these societies, you find a mild son preference. But in a few societies, um, daughters are rigidly excluded from helping their parents. Daughters have to marry they ha and they must support and take care of their husband's parents. And this generates very strong son preference. And this is, the, this is the kinship system that's found in all the settings that manifest sex selection. Um, these, these settings actually, sex selection is a downside, but these uh, 
particular forms of rigid patrilineage were quite useful in many ways um, in the pre-industrial world. They functioned as corporate units and they were quite effective for managing and protecting people before the modern state. Um, it's very well documented in the literature for China, Korea, and Northwest India, for example. So then what exacerbates sex selection within a given setting? First is risk. So what you're seeing here is um, the estimated proportions of women missing by their birth cohort in China from 1920 to 1990. And you see that this goes up and down. Um, the proportions of women missing went up during the internal wars in China. Uh, it shot through the roof when the Japanese invaded. People were basically getting rid of their girls um, because they could only manage so much. And if they had to make choices, they would obviously prefer to keep their boy children. Then the communist government was established and um, access to resources was really made um, available on a communal basis rather than um, on, a, on a household basis. And so how many sons or daughters you had made very little difference to the access you had to communal resources. Um, as a result, even with a massive famine like the Great Leap Famine, there was just a little blip in excess female child mortality. And then you got um, a combination of the one child policy where people could only uh, had you know, one or two uh, slots for children. If the first child was a girl, they were in most parts of China, they were allowed to have a second child but only that. Um, so the pressure to make sure you had a son either the first time or the second time was very high. And at the same time, the communes were dismantled, which meant that your, communal, your access to communal resources was uh, taken away. And you once again depended on your family, on your household, and on your ability to have sons. Um, for protecting yourself against risk and in your old age. So again, the proportions of women missing went right up again. And of course, new technologies make it much easier to get rid of unwanted girls. So you compare South Korea 1982, where people were doing some amount of sex selection, especially in higher birth orders, to 1989, in between um, sex selection technology became widespread. And you find that people still up to the second birth uh, are doing relatively little sex selection, but they don't want to have large families and they do want their sons. So for the third birth and the fourth and above, um, you had very high levels of sex selection. So what helps to reduce that selection? People have tried a bunch of specific policies. Um, some of these, such as bans on prenatal sex selection um, and offering conditional cash transfers to parents to raise their children, uh, to raise their daughters. These are complex to implement. Um, it's not easy to actually make sure that uh, a ban is enforced. And well, I, I'm not, I don't have a slide on my work on China here, but when they actually tried very hard to enforce the ban, people found all kinds of ways of getting around it. Um, they're complex to implement and there's limited in evidence of impact. Then a second category is pension schemes. Um, formal employment typically offers pensions, but non-formal employment um, also, um, a, a number of countries tried to start some kind of schemes for pensions for people in the non-formal sector. Um, and in the case of China, 
this has been documented to have some impact. Um, more recently, uh, uh, the Avenstein has looked at uh, this phenomenon elsewhere, including in Korea and in the South Caucasus, and he finds that pension schemes do have an impact on reducing sun preference, which is what you would expect if people depend on sons for old age support. Then there's laws for establishing gender equity. And uh, some of these kinds of laws for say equal inheritance or to encourage women's um, engagement and political participation, uh, actual representation, um, not just voting, but actually standing as candidates. Um, these laws have been shown to have some impact in the context of India, where the data are relatively easily available for this. And finally, there's mass media advocacy, which has been found to have quite dramatic impact on behavioral change, um, not just on sun preference, but on a very wide range of things, on voting behavior, on tobacco use, on uh, use of contraception, um, on all kinds of things. And the broader social changes include uh, many things that happen in the course of development. One is urbanization. So you live and work in relatively impersonal settings in an apartment block, you work in an office. You're not constantly surrounded by members of your husband's patrilineage who are pressuring you to have a boy. And in an urbanized society, the chances that a daughter or a son may live near the parents become more equal because the son might migrate to another city to work and the daughter might uh, work in the same city as you live. Um, so girls can be as valuable as boys in that context. Industrialization uh, makes a lot of difference because it links your access to income from your membership of a given lineage uh, and access to the lineage resources of land, etc. You, uh, you earn an income simply by having a job which has nothing to do with which lineage you belong to. And it offers wider possibilities for saving for your old age. Then there's exposure to new ideas, obviously through education, but also through changing social norms of people that you come in contact with on a regular basis. And the process of changing norms can be accelerated by media efforts. Um, so turning to the insights from South Korea, uh, it's really very interesting because South Korea had in the mid nineties, the strongest uh, manifestation of sun preference as shown in uh, you know, a very high proportion of boys to girls in the population. And by now they've already shifted um, to daughter preference. So what you see here uh, on the left, the, the red line is South Korea. You see that um, compared to other countries in East Asia and South Asia, their levels of sun preference uh, of sex selection shot up um, and you had very high proportions of boys to girls. But then you see that shortly thereafter it came down and it's nearly normal. And by normal, I'm looking at this broad blue line, which is um, the, what the UN calls more developed regions, i.e. Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, where sex selection is not widely prevalent. Um, similarly, when you compare South Korea with the co countries in the South Caucasus and Albania, which are the only other countries outside of East and South Asia that have been known to exhibit this kind of strong sun preference, um, you see the similar pattern. Um, South Korea was much earlier uh, in rising and then 
it, it is the first to normalize. Georgia seems to be on, on its way to being the second to normalize. And you see a very dramatic shift in what people report. The percentage of respondents in successive surveys in South Korea, the percentage of respondents who say they absolutely must have a son has gone down from nearly half the respondents in the mid 80s to a very low level, uh, below 6% by 2015. And in the case, uh, and the proportions who don't care what the gender is have shut up. Now, a different set of surveys in South Korea asked, if you were to have only one child, would you prefer a son, a daughter, or do you not care? And these surveys show a, a very steep rise in the proportions of women who report that if they were to only have one child, they would prefer to have a daughter. Nearly half of them by 2013 are reported that they wanted only a daughter. And a very wide range of policies have been in place. Uh, as you know, South, America, uh, South, uh, South Korea um, has developed at uh, lightning speed um, from, the, from being really um, in very poor shape uh, economically in the 1950s through the 1960s on, onwards, they really developed at lightning speed. And a whole bunch of economic policies have reduced the financial dependence on sons. Um, general development, mass education, industrialization. And uh, from 1977 onwards, a series of national programs sought to reduce risk through establishing health insurance and pensions. These were gradually put in place. They didn't happen overnight, but they were put in place from the late 1970s onwards. Then there were intensive mass media campaigns to encourage people to value daughters. In the 1970s and 1980s, the focus was on family planning messages they didn't want people to have large families just in order to finally manage to have a son. Um, and then in the 1990s, the messaging risk remained the same, but the reason for it was that they didn't want to have an imbalanced sex ratio in their population. Then there was a series of different kinds of legislation for gender equity. Uh, there were changes in the family law, incremental changes over several decades, but eventually um, you got equal rights uh, of women and men to inheritance, uh, equal rights in the case of divorce, uh, rights to um, child custody and so on. Um, now legally, um, the family name can be that of either the man or the woman or both. And men are no longer the legal authority in charge of the family. Um, in 1987, you got uh, a law say, uh, requiring that gender equality be pursued at work. Of course, um, these things are slow and South Korea is still a long way from having gender equality at work, but nevertheless, a lot of change did take place. And in 2000, they had a law requiring that people have quotas for political representation, quotas specifically for men, for, for women. And in 1987, they banned sex detection. So what you see here is uh, the blue line is sex ratios at birth between 1970 and 2010. And I'm so sorry. And you see the timeline from 1970 onwards, women were educated, brought into the labor force. Um, the population became rapidly urbanized and there was very strong advocacy against sun preference and so on. I mean, the, the speed of South Korea's development is reflected in this figure, which shows you the speed of change. Um, in different kinds of 
uh, government policy. And this is an example of the intensive, um, really saturation advertising um, to discourage sun preference. Uh, and what this poster says is daughter or son, stop it to and bring them up well. And the father is shown as being happy to have two daughters and no son. Um, this was absolutely everywhere you looked in South Korea, posters, television spots, all over the place. Um, the decline um, in sun preference spread very quickly through South Korea. Um, Wu Jin Chung and I did some analysis of, the, of a series of Korean national surveys. And we found that the odds of, of women saying that they absolutely must have a son, it declined as you would expect with education, urban residence and so on. But if you took a pooled sample of the 1991 and 2003 surveys, um, it was evident that the largest decline was simply the fact that it was a different survey year. It was 12 years later. And this means that changes in norms snowballed across the country. If you decompose that decline, you see that nearly three quarters of the decline was attributable to changes in social norms. And about a quarter was attributable to changes in education and urban residence, in each case controlling for the other. Um, and then more recently, um, Hiran Chun and I did an analysis of a national survey in 2012, which asked this question, did, if you have one child, would you like a son, daughter, or do you not care? And we found that odds of preferring a daughter were higher if you were more exposed to societal transformations, i.e. if you lived in metropolitan regions, if you were more educated and if you were younger, which is pretty much what you would expect. And that's what the data show. Um, the odds of preferring a daughter are also higher if you belong to a category with less traditional values as reflected in your views on gender roles and as reflected in your religion. Uh, atheists and Protestants have a um, much higher probability of saying that they would prefer a daughter as compared to the traditional religion. So basically what you find uh, from other studies is a shift in intergenerational support from the parent-son dyad to the parent-daughter dyad. Um, Choi and Choi and Kim at all find that um, emotional support to parents is now stronger from daughters. And women provide more childcare for their daughters. That's Lee and Bauer's study. So in both directions, daughters support their parents and the mothers support their daughters. Um, and what's also notable uh, is that when you compare South Korea and Japan to the rest of the highly developed countries, the, the OECD countries, you find that there's much higher levels of co-residence in South Korea um, the, uh, and in Japan than in the, the rest of the developed world, which means that there's also much higher expectations of intergenerational support. Now, if you don't expect intergenerational support, you would expect just an erosion of sun preference and you're basically indifferent to the gender of the child. But since you do have expectations of intergenerational support, in this case, they show a shift to daughter preference. So basically people's needs for old age support have changed in South Korea. Financial support is much less important now. Earlier sons would inherit the land and they supported their parents. Now people have their own savings. They have national health insurance, they have pension programs. 
So they don't need financial support so much in their old age. What's much more important now is emotional and physical support because longevity is increasing. And so you're going to live to older and older ages and daughters are perceived as better at providing emotional and physical support than sons and daughters-in-law. So what people now want from their children as um, a journalist, um, so uh, quoted one of her, uh, one of the people she interviewed, what people now want from their children is not a bowl of rice, but tender loving care. That's basically the shift that's taken place in South Korea. So to conclude, sex selection is driven by cultures that force parents to depend on sons. In these settings, sex selection rises with risk levels and with technological ease of sex selection. So what changes such cultures? Firstly, broad social changes, such as urbanization and industrialization that reduce the power of lineages and exposure to new norms through education, mass media, uh, the community around you. Specific policies also help change um, these cultures, especially uh, laws for more equal uh, access to resources and specific policies for outreach through mass media. What also helps is reducing the environment of risk in which people live, the risk that they face for old age. So if you have better savings instruments, um, um, greater access to health insurance and pensions uh, in old age. This is really very important um, for making people feel that they don't need to depend on their children for financial support in old age. And this is what's illustrated by South Korea's shift from strong son preference to daughter preference. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Dasgupta. Um, I would like to invite everyone again to please um, submit questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will move on to our last panelist, Daniel Idrisu. Daniel Idrisu is currently pursuing a master's in international and regional studies with a specialization in African studies at the University of Michigan. He obtained a BA degree from the University for Development Studies in Ghana in 2017, where he also worked as a teaching assistant from 2017 to 2018. His research focuses on gender, development, and health. Please welcome Daniel Idrisu. Okay, th thank you so much, Grace, for that introduction. And then thanks to the International Institute for putting this together. So, yeah. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Okay, good. All right, so my, my presentation examines how um, malaria prevention, care seeking and treatment differ between female headed households and then male headed households in Ghana. And then the analysis is done using um, the malaria indicator survey of 2019 to do that. Yeah. So um, this is the outline of the presentation. We'll look at the background on the problem, the methods used for the study, the preliminary results and then the conclusion. Um, so yeah, background on the problem. So it is estimated by the World Health Organization that 90% of children in Sub-Saharan Africa actually suffer from malaria. And then out of that percentage, 21% of um, that is seen as the prevalence rate of malaria in Ghana. And then it is estimated that 20,000 children die of malaria in Ghana, that is every year. And then out of that, 25% of them are actually children under five years. 
So um, because this study wants to look at how malaria is being prevented and then how care is sought for under five children in female headed households. So we looked at it and then we found out that about 25% of households in Ghana are actually headed by females. But then it is not clear whether female headed households have a different care pattern related to malaria compared to uh, male headed households. Okay, so um, methods used for the study. So basically, um, like I indicated, um, the data I was getting from the Malaria Indicator Survey of 2019, which is part of um, the Demographic and Health Survey Program. And then the sample frame constitutes um, listings of, of households that were in the 2010 population and housing census. The answer that um, 5,181 women between the ages of 15 and 49 were selected for the study. And then um, children between the months of six and then 59 were also selected for malaria testing and then anemia as well. Okay, so data collection. So um, household data was collected from both male and female headed households. I'm taking into consideration um, the ownership and usage of um, insecticide treatedness, and then the prevalence and treatment of fever that is within under five children. And then um, malaria testing was also done using rapid diagnostic testing. And then that is a blood sample taken from the finger or the heel, and then conduct um, the test. And then the results were taken, were confirmed through a microscopy at the National Public Health and then Reference Laboratory. All right, so data analysis. So basically, R and STATA were used to generate the descriptive statistics and frequencies for the study. And then as well, bivariate analysis were conducted, you know, comparing male and female headed households with regards to um, malaria prevention and then malaria testing, as well as the positivity rate between um, those categories of households. So uh, preliminary findings. So um, this um, project is a work in progress. So um, the findings presented here might not be the same as the findings I might get at the end of the project, but I don't expect any significant differences between what I'll present here to what I'll get at the end of the project. So um, the findings indicate that uh, male-headed households actually have um, greater access to um, bed nets compared to uh, female-headed households, and that is significant at um, P value equal to um, 0 0.001. And um, under five children, that is within a female-headed household, also have um, stands a higher chance of sleeping under treated mosquito nets compared to um, those that are found within um, female-headed households. And so testing for malaria in under five children, that is within male-headed households compared to female-headed households, is also like not, do there is a bit of difference between them. Whereas like male-headed male households is specifically lower compared to female-headed households, but the difference between the two is not statistically significant. So um, positive malaria cases are about similar, that is between male-headed and female-headed households. And so despite the fact that um, male-headed households have greater access to um, you know, mosquito nets, and then their children stand the chance to sleep under treated bed nets. The positivity rate between male-headed and female-headed households is not statistically significant. So that means female-headed households are actually doing um, you know, some stuff that are related to malaria prevention that male-headed households are not actually doing. So um, this uh, figure is a presentation 
that sort of tries to illustrate um, the differences with regards to male and female headed households. That is the number of households that have um, children under five and the number of households that have children under five who tested for malaria and then the number of households that have um, children under five whose malaria test results actually turn out positive. So um, in general, 5,181 households were selected for the study. And then breaking that down, 62.6% were actually male-headed, whilst 37.4% um, of them were female-headed. So as a subset of that, we have 67.8% of the male-headed households having children under age five, and then 51.7% of female-headed households also have children under five. So um, going down, so with the female-headed households, 51% of them with child under five had all children sleep under a treated bed and the last night before the survey was conducted. And then so to the female-headed households, 44.8% of them had children sleep under a treated bed net a ninth to the survey. So um, narrowing down, um, so 24.2% of male-headed households with um, child under five who had like, who with their children having fever, like the previous two weeks before um, the survey was conducted. And then the female-headed households also have 23% of um, their children who had fever the previous two weeks before the survey was conducted. So with that, 39% um, of male-headed households with a child under five who had fever actually tested for malaria. So it means that 39% of female-headed households actually picked their children who had symptoms of fever and then subjected them to malaria tests. And then 41%, 41.3% of female-headed households also had their children with fever tested for malaria. And so 63% of the children that tested for malaria actually came positive. That is in the male-headed households. And then 63% of them turned out positive in female-headed households. So these are the key takeaways. So um, the study reveals that more than one third of households in Ghana are actually headed by um, females. And that is um, a great number that needs uh, more, more attention because um, the system is structured in a way that male-headed households are, are favored. Um, they have access to productive resources like land, they have access to um, you know, the best of education and all other resources. So, and looking at the findings of the study, though female-headed households don't have access to other resources compared to um, male-headed households, but they are able to ensure that the prevalence of malaria within their households is at a minimal level. So it means that if attention is given to female-headed households, um, the cases of malaria and then its prevalence rate in general is likely to reduce. So female-headed households are slightly less likely to own a bed net and, and their children are slightly less likely to sleep under a bed net. And then um, female-headed households and male-headed households are similar in terms of the percentage who reported under five fever in the past two weeks with female-headed households slightly less likely than male-headed households. So, and it also shows that um, female-headed households are slightly more likely to get their children tested for malaria. And out of that um, test, the positivity rate between male-headed and female-headed households is similar. So um, to conclude, um, even though female-headed households are less likely to own a bed net than male-headed household. Rates of fever among under five children 
are slightly lower in female headed households. Rates of testing for malaria are slightly higher and the rates of positivity are identical. That is between a male headed and female headed households. So this is, we've just gone through um, the background on the problem, the methods, the preliminary findings, and then conclusion. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I'm very excited for our discussion. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to please begin um, submitting your questions through the Q&A feature. And um, I, I would like to start with the, the first uh, question that I see in the Q&A. So I'm going to um, hit answer live so you can all read it. Um, this question is from Mahin Humayun. Um, who is a PhD candidate at the Epidemiology Department, University of Michigan. I'm trying to study gender disparities related to tuberculosis occurrence. Men are generally considered to be at a higher risk compared to women. However, we see that this may not be true in some regions of the world where women are actually at a higher risk. As many of you here are addressing similar questions, I am looking to hear your ideas, suggestions, or resources to better understand why this gender disparity varies across different regions of the world. If you have any thoughts or are just interested in the topic, I would love to chat and learn more from you. All right. Would anyone like to um, address that question? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I would think about occupational exposures. I would think about sort of, I would think about differences in the way men and women in a culture convene. And if that's sort of socially, if that's occupationally, because I, I again, I'm not an infectious disease doc, but you know, TB is transmit, transmitted by close contact. And so I would think in terms of how people congregate and if that's different fundamentally from men and women, but I would love to hear what the other panelists think. Any other thoughts? I mean, I, I was thinking the same thing, Cheryl, that, that you know, I think there's a lot of differences across societies in physical mobility and um, whether they're same sex interaction and opposite sex interaction and just the extent of, of interaction be, beyond, um, you know, kind of your, your household. And, and that surely must play a role in exposure to TB and, and other diseases. If, if the pattern is different for TB than for other infectious diseases, then, um, you know, that's probably not going to be enough uh, to explain patterns. But so I guess, you know, kind of Another interesting avenue to pursue is just seeing if, if the patterns you're seeing for TB in some societies versus another uh, mirror what you see for other infectious diseases or if it's a TB specific phenomenon. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your question, Mahin. Um, I also have two questions here from um, Dr. Youngju. Uh, and she asks um, for two different people. Um, number one is for Cheryl. Um, she says, thank you for the talk, Professor Moyer. It really resonated with me, the point that you made that mother-in-laws, um, given their age and status in the family, are able to supersede gender norms. I'm curious to know in your field work, do you see mothers-in-law also adopt the gendered blame woman log a logic, or can they meaningfully advocate for other female members in any way? What a fabulous question. Wow. Um, you know, I don't know that I have enough uh, data to be able to say anything definitive. I think we've seen mother-in-laws tilt both directions. I think we've seen mother-in-laws advocate and I think we've also seen mother-in-laws pile on when other people are blaming women. Um, they certainly are in a position to be amazing advocates. Um, and obviously that would be a goal. I think, you know, the piece that I find interesting in this is as we think about 
you know, improving maternal outcomes, as we think about improving neonatal health, how can we get everybody on the same page with that in mind, rather than thinking about who's to blame, who's at fault, et cetera. So um, great question. I wish I had more, dis more concrete data to answer it better than that, but that's what I've got. Very interesting. Um, Dr. Zhu also has a question for Monica. Um, she says, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dasgupta, for your talk. I'm wondering to what extent do you think marriage norms may also contribute to declining son preference in South Korea, that parents need to provide greater financial resources for sons so that they can be competitive on the marriage market? There we go. Um, thanks. That, that's an excellent question. Um, it's uh, a couple of the, we know that in uh, South Korea, uh, parents have to provide more for a son's marriage than a daughter's marriage. And in the sense of traditionally, they were expected to provide housing and so on. Um, so it's the very opposite of dowry. It did seem to prevent people from wanting to have sons though. Um, that's no longer so much the case in South Korea, but we do know that um, uh, people spend more on uh, educating sons, uh, partly because they want them to go to the more high profile universities, which they don't feel is necessary for daughters but also partly because um, there's still a sort of cu cultural norm that sons should be super successful and daughters are not expected to necessarily be super successful or encouraged to be super successful. So some studies show that um, people actually spend more on sons and that they report that this is one of the downsides of having a son because you have to uh, not only spend more on it, but you are, it's a source of stress for the parent. You know, is the son going to make it? How did he do in his exams this year and next year and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the things that in the paper that I presented, it, we write it up, but I didn't uh, mention it in the talk because of shortage of time. So I'm really glad you brought this up. It's a, it's a very important point. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Zhu, for asking those questions. Uh, I would like to pose one of my own for all of the panelists here. Um, so the role of the state or government power seems to be quite different across um, the different case studies, if you want to call them that, that you're looking at. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the role of the state or government power in structuring responsibility for maternal infant and child health. So in terms of providing access to care, um, procuring care, uh, distributing labor, or defining familial roles and responsibilities, I'm curious what um, you think the role of the government has had. I know one of the rest of you wants to answer that first. I know you do. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. So, um, you know, in my work in uh, in India, I guess the, uh, the part, you know, part of the punchline is that um, where the challenges are, aren't across families, they're within families. And so that's a fundamental challenge for governments, because a lot of what governments do is is interact with the head with the, you know, the, the mother or the head of household or the household as a whole, and then um, not try to, you know, they're not engaging child by child, you know, as they're giving a cash transfer or something. But, you know, there are innovative policies that can, once you're, once you know that a lot of the inequality is once you give resources to a family, how they allocate them, you know, you can um, give some in-kind transfers like meals at daycare centers that are, aren't as fungible. So if girls get a healthy meal, at least one healthy meal a day at a daycare center, that's going to be beneficial. You know, state governments have, uh, change the subsidy rate so that 
for girls, the healthcare is cheaper. Is there are fewer copays for health visits for girls and boys? Just realizing you're going to need to subsidize, um, you're going to have to kind of give an extra nudge for parents to provide equal care to um, daughters and sons. And so I think there's probably more scope for policy innovation um, that's you know trying to take into account that you might not have a one size fit all policy for different um, children within a family. And then, you know, I think kind of on the broader question of the sex ratio, you know, some of my recent research is, is working with state governments in India to try to change these norms about having um, sex selective abortions or restricting women's ability to work in all many aspects of gender equality. And, and in those cases, state governments were very much interested in changing these restrictive gender norms in their society. Um, you know, I would love to think it's because they are on the forefront of human rights um, progress, you know, but even without that, there's a very pragmatic reason why governments might want to use women and girls' talent, you know, using women's talents to raise GDP per capita, or, you know, why you don't want lots of men who uh, are struggling to find a wife and, if, you know, are, are frustrated young men. Um, is something most governments don't want in their society. And so in that sense, um, I think, you know, some aspects of, of gender equality are, are, you know, very much in, in government's interest to, um, to try to solve. And, you know, that's great because this work I'm doing on changing gender norms is using schools. You know, governments have so much more of a reach uh, than any NGO or um, kind of local civil service organization that if you can get governments engaged, you just have um, so much uh, more scope to, to reach a lot of people quickly. I think I would love to hear Daniel's thoughts on Ghana, because Ghana has had a national health insurance scheme that has evolved. And part of the point behind the national health insurance was to make sure that moms and babies had access to care. There's a free maternal health policy that is supposed to provide care for moms and babies. But I know the theory and the implementation have not always been equal. So Daniel, could you tell us a little bit about what national health insurance in Ghana has looked like? OK, so yeah. So. Um, I think some years back, um, the government made it free for pregnant women to access healthcare, you know, in all their visits and all that. And even after giving birth, there was the opportunity for the woman to sort of have the child on her national health insurance scheme to access healthcare for free till the child turns 18. But um, the, I think the problem with that is um, associated with um, regulation and how the policy is being monitored. Because though women are supposed to get all those stuff for free, but when they are going to give birth, they have to go with gloves, you know, and other things for the midwives. So though government policies are actually putting women as a priority, but moving down to the grassroots, I think there is the need for more work to be done in order to ensure that those policies really reflect in um, the life of women as intended, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's one thing when the theory is that you get free care. It's another thing when you are supposed to bring your own gloves, your own soap, your own sheet, your own you know blankets, et cetera, to the hospital. So it does create a, a slightly different um, set of issues. But I think it is one example where the government has at least tried to provide good care to improve maternal and newborn outcomes. I mentioned a paper by um, Pascaline Dupa and Radhika Jain in, um, in India that looked at like, the expansion of, of health and government health insurance for the poor. And I don't know that the goal, was, it wasn't specifically about maternal and infant health, but you know, de facto it ended up having a much um, bigger impact on the healthcare of, of girls and women just because cost was a, a barrier. And so in that sense, um, I guess that's a, that one was implemented in a gender neutral way, but, but ended up narrowing gender gaps in a positive way. And Dr. Dasgupta, I know that you spoke quite at length about the role of the state in South Korea, but I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit more about the mass media campaigns that they, um, 
that they embarked upon um, and what their messaging was in that. Basically, um, what South Korea did when they established their family planning program um, is they had intensive outreach um, to let people know what kind of um, contraception was available, where they could get it, um, encouraging women uh, to use the contraception. They set up mother's clubs in villages and small towns where people would get together and talk about these things. Um, so it was a very intensive program. Um, and a major part of that included trying to encourage uh, couples not to continue childbearing indefinitely until they finally had, had a son. Um, it, it's actually something which you see also in um, other parts of South Asia with some preference. You see the same kind of um, camp intensive campaign in China and uh, in India. Um, Southeast Asia doesn't have so much sun preference, but Southeast Asia had, I mean, every, every Asian country had very intensive family planning programs from the 1970s onwards. Um, but in the case of China, Korea, and India, they um, had this additional component of uh, trying to persuade people to feel that they should be satisfied even if they haven't had a son yet. Um, so that, that, that was a major part of the campaign. That's very interesting that it might vary in effectiveness by um, region or time period or something like that. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Dasgupta, I know that you have a question that you would like to ask and I would like to um, you know, hand the mic over to you and let you ask, ask the panelists. Thank you, Grace. Um, I found the two presentations on Ghana really very interesting, um, partly because I've never worked on Ghana. Um, and I had a comment um, for Cheryl, which is that um, what you were presenting is very reminiscent of of what studies in India and China find on the importance of the mother-in-law and how it constrains women from making decisions to access healthcare. Um, so um, I know it's crossing continents, but I thought you might find some of those studies um, interesting. Um, the, the sort of very parallel to what you were describing. And um, for Daniel's study, I, I, I found that really very interesting. I wondered um, from what I know of Ghana is it's very heterogeneous in terms of the amount of power that women have within the household. There's, there's parts of Ghana where, you know, it's essentially um, patrilineal and, you, you know, women, young women don't have that much power in the household. And then, uh, as far as I know, there's parts of Ghana where women are much more empowered and they're much more involved, uh, um, for example, in the market economy. Um, so I was wondering, um, assuming that this is true, if, uh, if there's enough scope given the sample size of the DHS to break down your analysis a little bit between these different types of group. It may not be possible because of the sample size, but just wondering. Okay, so um, with um, the sample size that um, the malaria indicator survey used, I think um, it is basically the number of female-headed households that are, you know, located in the entire Ghana. But um, for this study, I think uh, I'm sort of synthesizing down to look at female-headed households that are found within um, the northern part of Ghana like still using the same um, data from, you know, the malaria indicator survey. But yes, there are differences when it comes to, you know, Ghana have um, 16 different regions and each region has a different culture when it comes to 
um the way men and then women relate at the household level so and that sort of trickle down to the way resources are distributed between women and men and then you know um the kind of activities you can take within the household so there are some regions where you see that women are more sort of empowered and then others you see like you know women are not all that empowered but when it comes to the market economy like you indicated those considering ghana those are considered as you know sort of petty so they sort of leave that to women to do and that also constitutes another problem so because if you are a, a woman, there are some stuff that you can do. Maybe you can own a land to put up your own business aside going to the market to sell. So that is what you are expected to do. So you can own a land. Maybe if you are located in a farming community, you can own a land to yourself where you can, you know, you can practice agriculture. So before you can do that, you have to go and see a man. Then maybe he will decide to give you a parcel of land then the conditions might be that, okay, when you harvest, you give me this number of bucks from your produce, you know, in compensation of me giving you the land. So it's kind of complicated, though you might not see the differences, you know, if you look at it in general, but if you go deep into um, the communities, see that there are a lot of variations with regards to how women are treated compared to um, men, so yeah. I think the other piece that's interesting is the differences between urban and rural. And I think in first looking at the data, the of the female headed households, they're slightly more likely to be urban than rural. And so that raises a whole nother set of questions. So, you know, I think this is this is a project that could it, um, get rather large and unwieldy rather rapidly, <laughs> depending upon how long Daniel wants to take to finish his master's thesis. <laughs> so, but I think that's a great point that it would be great to try to subdivide and see what we can learn. Um, I think the challenge is just looking at um, malaria testing as an outcome measure makes it a pretty small N. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the audience. This is from Julie Busser uh, in the Center for International Reproductive Health and Training at the University of Michigan. Um, and Julie says, thank you, Daniel, for your interesting presentation. Can you briefly describe for us the next steps or larger implications of your study? Are there any public health initiatives based on your findings? Yeah, so um, thank you so much for that, that question. Um, I think that is an interesting question. So um, from what I have at the moment, um, you know, when I was reading through, um, trying to see what has been done in the field with regards to under five malaria treatment and then care seeking, um, and then how malaria, you know, strategies that are on board in Ghana and other African countries to sort of, um, prevent malaria. I came across this article um, that was conducted between Ghana and then Kenya. And, you know, in Ghana, we have um, a mass distribution campaign for bed nets, of which uh, every woman is supposed to get a bed net for the family. Um, if you have a child who is under five, you're supposed to get a bed net and all that. And the same program is being run in Kenya as well. So the study was conducted to actually see how, you know, women are actually assessing badness with ease. So, and it was revealed that um, though men are not supposed to assess those, those badness, they are meant for only women and then they are under five children. But one way or the other, men also manage their way through to assess those nests. So um, with public policy initiative, I think it would be better to sort of try to see how best um, badness dis distribution and other initiatives that relates to malaria prevention can be well regulated so that the target population will actually um, you know, have the benefits of um, those initiatives. Because just like um, the study indicated, 
female headed households or females in general that are supposed to have bed nests for free don't actually have access to that so that is one uh, key thing i intend to do that is sort of make my findings available to um, the ghana health service and the ministry of health so that they can see how best they work around it to ensure that um badness don't leak into um, the hands of individuals that are not supposed to you know have them so yeah basically that's what I, I i intend to do um to ensure that you know um, female-headed households actually benefit from health initiatives that are meant for them. If I can just add a comment to that, just last week there was the announcement of a new malaria vaccination, and that is a game changer for under five malaria in the next you know decade. And we do know that female-headed households, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, I think female-headed households are more likely to get their kids vaccinated. And so there's the question of whether or not malaria and what the implications of this study would look totally differently when there's a vaccine on the market that women can go and access just like they access all the other childhood vaccinations. So it's, a, it's an interesting set of issues we're, we're gonna be looking at. Um, I have one more question and I encourage audience members again to submit through the Q&A. Um, otherwise, this might be it. Uh, but I, I came up with this question before the panel and I think after listening to everybody speak, we've sort of covered this terrain in a variety of different ways, but I was wondering um, if you could talk about the role that mothers play in decision making around um, their health or the health of their children in all these different contexts, because um, obviously we have the example from Daniel of female headed households and their decision making around their children's health. But then in um, other examples, we have, you know, couples making decisions together. Um, and I am wondering if we could maybe break that down a little bit more to talk about the role of gender in the family in making decisions in family planning and seeking care. So that's for everyone. I feel like I've done too much talking, but I'll, I'll take a stab at responding. Um, you know, we have some data to suggest that when you compare babies who have, well, there's a different decisional process when it's seeking care for a sick mom than when it's seeking care for a sick baby. At least where we've worked in Ghana, the emphasis on maternal mortality prevention has been high so that when a mom gets sick, everybody knows get mom to the hospital. And so there tends to be resource identification, transportation secured, and they get moms to the hospital. With babies, Unfortunately, there can be a sense that babies are a bit more replaceable. And so you have a bit of a debate about, well, how many resources do we have and what's the cost and what's the benefit and what's the likelihood this is a good thing. And so in the households where the mom says she has the strongest voice in decision-making about the care for her children, those kids are more likely to survive than in the households where the mom says she doesn't have the strongest voice in making the decision about child care seeking. We don't see that in maternal health care seeking. So I think the issues around health care seeking are not universal. It kind of depends upon the context and it depends upon what type of care we're talking about. But in emergency settings, if mom has the strongest voice, her baby is more likely to survive, at least from what we've seen in northern Ghana. Um, I'd just like to add to what Cheryl just said, which is from the Asian perspective, there's been um, many studies um, all over the place showing that um, if just using the fact of household structure, so if the household has the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, what are the outcomes in terms of decision-making? And if it's a nuclear household, so only the woman is involved in her own decision making, um, healthcare seeking is found to be generally much slower if 
if there's two levels of decision making, if there's a mother-in-law involved, which is pretty much what Cheryl uh, said. And it's just another way of doing it in, in that context. Um, of course, one dimension of that is it tends to be a life cycle thing. So oh, when women first marry into a patrilineal home, they tend to be living in a joint family with the in-laws present. And then as they, you know, within about 10 years, they tend to, you know, another child marries, brings in their uh, wife. And so the older son tends to become more nuclear. Um, so there's a life cycle aspect to it, but just using household structure within a survey um, has been found to be pretty simple and effective. Daniel, I, I have a thought, but if you want to jump in, you can jump in. Mine's going to be kind of a down. Okay, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, mine's a downer um, observation, which is I, I think there's like a kind of a um, uh, you know maybe like a not so intuitive way that w with sex selection um, the problem can get worse when there's more women's empowerment. Um, so one of the you know one of the reasons that's one thing that's putting pressure on uh, the sex ratio in India, you know, and Monica's the the pioneer of this is is the fact that. Um, people want to have smaller families, you know, over time and as, as India gets richer. And so if you really want to have one son, you know, when you were having four kids, there was just a one in 16 chance you weren't going to get a son naturally. And, but now most families want to have two kids. And so now 25% of them um, aren't going to get a son. So that's just a general trend that's declining. Wanting a smaller family size makes the sex ratio worse. And so the, you know, what, what does that have to do with women's empowerment? Well, women might have less of this desire to have a son. So if women have more power, then all things being equal, you'd say, oh, that's good for the sex ratio. They get to say, they get more power, they're not gonna wanna have an abortion. But part of what happens when women get more power is that their fertility preferences about number of kids get heard more. So just systematically around the world, you know, men want more kids than, than uh, women. And there's some negotiation that happens that determines their family size. So, you know, if men want three kids and women want two, and now the woman is able to kind of prevail and, and the family decides to have a smaller family size. And then when women get more power, you have two things going on. You know, one is uh, she gets to achieve her goal of having a smaller family and, you know, all, all else equal, she cares less about making sure the family has a son. And when you put those two things together, um, you know, it's quite possible that the first one is what dominates and you know like kind of what we think of as progress for women of women's education or um you know could end up actually make, making the the sex ratio worse i think it's just a like a very ironic and peculiar to this issue challenge where we're, we don't have what we normally expect which is like uh, when women have more power all sorts of other good things um for girls follow along I'm literally just reading an article called Empowerment Gone Bad, and it's all about the, the duality of empowerment, as empowerment not necessarily always a positive construct. So I, I'm just furiously writing down what you were saying. Daniel, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, you need to end us on a more positive note, Daniel. Yeah, so um, like what uh, Professor Selimoya said, um, in Ghana, basically, um, you know, when it comes to seeking care for children, it's quite different compared to um, the, the mother because um, there are communities and then societies that sort of recognize the man, you know, in all spheres of the household. So any decision at all that, released to the household, the man must be involved. So, and that translates into when he, like healthcare seeking. So the baby might be sick, but even if the father is not in the house, they have to call, make sure they get him, ask for permission before they take um, the child to the hospital. And that happens, you know, in the northern part of Ghana when it comes to, you know, seeking care for, um, for, for children. And, you know, it sort of looks like, 
um, a hierarchy. If the man is not there, and then his mother, who is the grandmother, is there. So she sort of supersedes all those kind of decisions. So, and I think I read a paper some time ago about healthcare seeking, and it indicated that a lot of children actually die as a result of that. You know, you are trying to get to the father or the grandmother to ask for permission before you go, you know, to the hospital, and then you are not getting him or, you know, in, or something like that. So you have to wait, and then the longer you wait, the, you know, the worse the sickness gets. So, yeah, that's, that's what happens. Yeah. One thing I will add is we have anecdotal evidence, not statistically rigorous, to suggest that in families with multiple wives, the kids get care because the co-wives will work together to get the children to care. And so that's another sort of counterintuitive that, oh, polygamy can be actually helpful for infant outcomes, which is another whole area of research that I could spend a career doing. Well, thank you all. You have blown my mind today. Um, I learned just so much from this. I want to say thank you again to all of you on the panel and thank you to the audience for um, listening and contributing your questions. And um, the, our next panel, which is Collective and Gendered Bodies Visualizing Health, will start at 3 p.m. in about an hour. So you will have time to take a break. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today.